welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Yo, remember that? Welcome back, Frommily. We're back, we're back. Yo, we are back. We're here with another deep dive and breakdown for the fifth episode of From, and I'm your host, Anthony, and let's get right into it. Now, the fifth episode of season two is titled Lullaby. As we all know, a lullaby is a song used to help quiet loud children or a song used to lull them to sleep. Now, in some societies, lullabies are also simple and repetitive songs used to pass down cultural knowledge and traditions of a society. Lullabies can actually be found in many countries and have existed since ancient times. Many lullabies, regardless of the meaning of their words, possess a peaceful, hypnotic quality. Now, there are also other lullabies that are mournful and dark, like a lament. Poet Federico Garcia Lorca studied Spanish lullabies and remarked about the poetic character and depth of sadness of many of them. Lorca's theory was that a large part of the function of the lullaby is to help a mother vocalize her worries and concerns in life and in short they also serve as a therapeutic way for a mother to express herself that's not creepy but first do me a favor before we go any further if you're new here please please consider giving this channel a like a subscribe to keep up with our weekly from analyses and breakdown and enable notifications so you're able to watch these videos right after the episode airs now Back to From. This new episode opens up with your boy, not Chris Evans, aka Randall, enjoying the amenities of his new abode. He has an open concept floor plan, huge gorgeous windows, and the most neighborly of neighbors who occasionally knock on the window at night. In fact, Randall gets woken up by these folks in the neighborhood looking to greet him, the people creature monsters. Randall wakes up to return the courteous favor and is about to f around and find out when the sweet old grandma that used to check on Frank's family comes by just to make sure that, you know, your boy's comfortable in his new digs. Randall finally makes another smart decision and decides not to answer to the door. The whole neighborhood comes to check on Randall and all jokes aside, something interesting happens when Randall begins antagonizing them and letting them know he's not scared. The people creature monsters actually do something I don't know if I've ever seen them do and they decide to just call it a night. Yep. Randall isn't scared, so they decide to go somewhere else. Now, this had me thinking, what is it that these things want from people? You know, they usually slowly stalk their prey before going for the kill, and we know that they get a kick out of it when people are terrified of them. Add this with the fact that it almost seems like they have a psychic ability to almost hypnotize their targets, and I can't help but wonder if there's some sort of either satisfaction or sustenance that they gain that Randall isn't providing. Do they eat fear? Are they psychic vampires? Maybe. Either way, Captain America might be onto something by not giving them what they simply want, and they leave. This is one moment I'm going to add to the whiteboard because it almost makes sense, but we need more evidence to back up this theory. I think my favorite theory right now is that they're actually fairies or fays of old folklore and are just terrorizing the people. If you're not familiar with the theory about fairies, the short story is that fairies of folklore were vicious, vindictive, and cruel lesser deities or even spirits of the dead, depending on the legend. And they often appeared as monstrous figures rather than the winged pixie-like beings we associate with the word today. Much folklore of fairies involves methods of protecting oneself from their ill intent by means of charms, like a talisman, or of rowan trees or various herbs or avoiding locations known to be theirs, ergo avoiding offending any fairies. Like I said, this is one of my favorite theories so far, one that seems to really fit into the narrative of From if it's true. Back to From. We switch over to Jade who looks like he's nursing a poor man's vodka hangover and out of nowhere he starts having another vision after looking up his photo of young Victor. This time he sees the guy that's also in the photo holding open the book which promptly freaks Victor to f out. Jade provides the correct response to any strange man standing over me in my sleep and he screams at the top of his lungs. Jade's visions seem to be happening more frequently and I still don't know what the f any of them mean. We switch over to our boy Boyd who's sleeping in the pews of Father Cotri's house and he gets woken up by someone knocking with all their might and oh sh 
Tabitha and Jim show up with some black Air Force One energy ready for the smoke. Now, if you somehow forgot in season one, Sarah got a message from the voices in her head to kill the boy, aka Ethan. And she actually was out here trying to do it. She locked Tabitha in a barn and was ready to do to Ethan what she did to Toby with the screwdriver and scalpel until she was stopped by her brother Nathan, who took a scalpel to his neck for his trouble. Tabitha and Jim got some 50 cent Ja Rule energy and clearly this beef ain't over. Boyd tries to play peacemaker and let them know how important Sarah is and once again, Tabitha and Jim channel their inner 50 cent by letting Boyd know they don't give up how important that bitch is. I'm sorry, they didn't say all that, but I got excited for real. As a parent, I get it. I don't give a who you are or how important you might be. I will burn this fucking town to the ground to kill the bitch who tried to touch my son. I'm sorry. I'm sorry again. I'm sorry, y'all, but you know what I'm saying, right? Like, <laughs> mm. I'm proud of Jim and Tabitha right here. Boyd has nothing except to try his best to turn the tables on Jim and Tabitha about how they've been f***ing up too. Boyd apparently has receipts and reminds them about the tower on Colony House and the hole that Tabitha was digging. Those weren't really doing anybody in the favors when they both failed. Surprisingly, Sarah brings her ass upstairs looking all stoic and Tabitha tells her straight up, come around if you want to die. Again, I love this energy from Tabitha because she's completely fed up. Sarah needs to die and that's all there is to it. They leave her with that warning, but again, this beef ain't over. Boyd decides to leave to tell Donna about Sarah before she hears about it from Kenny, who told Jim and Tabitha. We then switch to Ethan, who locked himself in his room after he heard Sarah was back. Tabitha and Jim return home and try to get Ethan to open the door when Ethan decides not to listen. Jim tries to calm him down by telling him a story from the Cromonocle and hold on, hold on. Have we spoken about the Cromonocle yet? I swear everything in this story is true and is a direct parallel to the situation that these people are in and how they might be able to escape. The Cromonocle story seems inconspicuous enough that until you realize it, it's not a real children's book and is something completely unique to this story. Ethan has spoken about the Cromonocle before about how the Cromonocle was traveling the rainbow sky and got lost in the cave of the lonely dragon and how she, the Cromonocle, she was given a map from the Lonely Dragon on how to escape the cave. I ignored this story like I'm sure a lot of people did, but the more I think about it, the more I believe this boy Ethan is spitting some hot fire, and he might be foreshadowing what needs to happen for their escape. More on that later. Jim brings up the story and talks about how the Cromonocle was afraid to go inside the cave. This is exactly what Ethan needs to hear and he finally opens the door to tell his parents that he wants to see Sarah. We then switch to Marielle and Christy who finally tell us Kenny's mom's name, Tian Chen. Apparently she makes some really good bread crisps. Marielle has a surprise for Christy and gives her her old t-shirt from home. Christy is happy to see her shirt and they have a tender moment reaffirming their commitment to one another while sharing some tender kisses and affection. We then switch to Sarah who walks into a house without knocking and just starts wandering around looking at stuff. She sees a shirt that used to belong to her brother Nathan, picks it up and continues looking around when some of the bus people show up and ask what she's doing there. Apparently they know about her and say, that girl is here, the one that killed her brother. <laughs> and they promptly tell her to get the fuck out and that she can't have the house back. Sarah asks them if they've seen a small ceramic ornament that she's looking for. They repeat that she needs to get the fuck out and all her shit was given to Mrs. Lou for storage. And once more with feeling, get the fuck out. We then switch to Jade who's doing some weird ass shit. He's aligning a bunch of bottles in Tom's bar in the shape of the symbol that he's obsessed with when Victor walks in. Did I mention how Jade is my favorite character on this show? Victor tells him that he doesn't look good. Jade said that the bar is closed and he's trying to figure out the symbol that Victor refuses to help him with. Victor finally agrees to tell him what he can, if Jade agrees to do something for him. But Jade is already in a mood and tells Victor to just f off. Jade comes to his senses, realizing the magnitude of what Victor is offering and asks Victor what it is that he wants. Victor steps outside, grabs his violin that Jade had taken from him before, and he wants Jade to play the violin for him. 
If Jade agrees to play the violin, then Victor will tell him about the man in the photo. Jade agrees and they leave to go to a location of Victor's choosing for Jade to play for him. We then switch to Tabitha and Jim on their porch talking about Ethan. Ethan mentioned that he wants to see Sarah and Tabitha doesn't want Sarah anywhere near her son. Ethan comes outside and drops some more knowledge that we all need to pay attention to. Ethan says, when you're on a quest, you have to face the scary things. That's how you take away their power. Ethan is telling us all the truths of this place. We need to pay attention to everything this boy says. And I think this is probably the biggest clue by far on how to face either the creature people monsters or whatever else is out there. We still haven't seen the boogeyman or the giant spider, so we'll have to wait and see. Tabitha agrees to trust Ethan and allow him to go see Sarah. We then switch to Boyd meeting up with Donna and Colony House, and they begin discussing Sarah. Donna is not happy at all that Boyd is not abiding by his own rules and putting Sarah in the box the second that he found her. Donna starts giving him the business. Boyd is like, she knows things, and Donna is all like, so f***ing what? We're still f***ing here. Voices or no voices, do you see a yellow brick road sending us home? Boyd eats his humble pie and Donna keeps it going and tells Boyd this isn't about Sarah. This is actually about Boyd's guilt about Abby. Boyd listens, but he's triggered by the mention of his wife, Abby. He asks Donna if she has her back or not. And Donna asks, what does Kenny's mom, Tian Chen, think about Sarah? Boyd just storms off. We then switch to Sarah outside the Matthews old house while staring at the diner she used to work in when Ethan and Jim roll up on her. Ethan walks up to Sarah and is all like, We thought you died, but you were living in the woods like a monster. I thought we were friends, but you're not because you're a monster and I'm not afraid of you. Little stupid bitch. Little dumb teacher, bitch. Sarah just says, Okay, and Ethan walks off. Is Sarah a monster? Was that figurative or literal? Like, is she one of the monsters and just forgot? Is that why she can hear voices? Let me not get too ahead of myself. But y'all know how I feel about Ethan. We then switch to Victor and Jade making their way through a field as they're traveling to a place for Jade to play the violin. Victor comments on the way that it's strange that the trees are changing. Jade is all confused by the statement when they finally arrive to a location we've never seen before. Victor brings Jade to some sort of car graveyard. Jade asks Victor if he did this, and Victor confirms he did. Once he was alone, he didn't want to look at them anymore. So he brought them someplace where he didn't have to see them. Jade is befuddled? Is that the word? My man is dumbfounded and just keeps listening as Victor mentions that there are even more cars beyond the rocks. But those cars were already there. Wait, what? This is the first time I remember Victor mentioning this place existing before his arrival. I mean, we all kind of knew this place must have been around for a long time. I mean, the whole town and stuff. But damn, how many cars are there? What are the makes and models? I find it super interesting that a lot of the cars we see in this shot are older cars, maybe 70s model cars, because let's be honest, the station wagon doesn't exist anymore. So we know that these cars are old. If we go beyond the rocks, will we see 50s cars? How about 40s? There's some really old pickup trucks here, but I'm not that much of a car guy, so I can't identify their year or make just by looking at them. But please, anybody from Lee, I, I need y'all if y'all watching this video, if you can identify the cars, please help us out. Let us know in the comments. Thank you. They continue walking and Victor apologizes to Jade for spazzing on him the day before and Jade accepts his apology. They walk up to a station wagon where Victor asks Jade to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on the violin. Jade figures out that the car belonged to Victor's mom. Victor gives us some insight and finally shares some of his backstory. Finally! And this is where it gets good. Victor tells Jade that his mother used to play the song to him when he was afraid. When Victor would hide at night and hear the people screaming, his mom would tell him to think about the twinkling stars and he wouldn't be afraid anymore. Now we know the reference for this episode's title, Lullaby. Jade begins playing for him and this may be the happiest we've ever seen Victor. It 
it's almost meditative and serene watching Victor in this scene. And I have to admit that this moment really, really tugs at the heartstrings, especially with Victor on the verge of tears at the end. But more importantly, this scene gives Victor so much depth and character development. I love character development. And this scene beautifully shows us a new side of Victor that helps us better understand the character. We finally see his vulnerable side. I can't help but think about the conversation that Victor had with Ethan the last episode when Victor told Ethan that he's lucky to have a mom like Tabitha. Man, Victor is climbing the ranks as one of my most liked characters in this show and Scott McCord did a great job acting the hell out of this scene. We then switch to Elgin who walks into Father Cotri's church to see Sarah sitting there alone in the pews. Elgin apologizes for interrupting, but for some reason doesn't leave when he realizes Sarah is in the room seemingly enjoying her privacy and instead Elgin just closes the door behind him. Now, I just want to point out for a second that this is very sus. I know a lot of people have a lot of theories about Elgin and I'm not going to try to prove or disprove any of them, but I will at least point out moments when Elgin is extremely sus. Elgin simply states that he didn't think anyone would be there and proceeds to make his way to his seat while staring at the cross on the wall. Elgin and Sarah chit chat for a bit sharing their stories and Elgin mentions that he hasn't seen Sarah and how he would have noticed her. Elgin talks about how he used to go to church with his grandmother. Sarah asks if that's where he was going on the bus. Elgin confirms it was and that he was going to see her like he does every weekend. I get the impression in this scene that Elgin is implying that his grandmother may be passed away. If this is the case, then this would add to our list of people who experienced significant life-changing experiences right before they ended up in this town. Elgin goes on to discuss how he used to visit his grandmother every weekend and go to church. In the afternoons, they would make crochet owls and how it was always an owl and she had hundreds of them and would give them to every person they met. She would only make owls. Hmm. Elgin looks like he's got a little bit of the googly eyes for Sarah and you know, he moves closer to her while speaking with her. Sarah looks like she's receiving Elgin's advances kinda nicely. Sarah talks about how she and her brother Nathan would collect little ornaments that she would paint. She also talks about how her brother kept one of those ornaments. Elgin asks if her brother is here now and Sarah tells Elgin that he was. Elgin asks about the ornament and where it is and Sarah says that it's probably in town but the person who has it probably won't give it to her. Elgin offers to help and asks why she doesn't stay in the colony house. Sarah then starts talking semi-religious and said it always seemed like a nice idea that no matter what you did if you were truly sorry then God would forgive you. Elgin said that it always felt like wishful thinking to him and asks if Sarah if she did something that needs forgiving. Sarah mentions that she killed her brother and the mood changes. Now, I'm not a huge fan of Elgin going out of his way to say wishful thinking. He was already acting sus when he walked into the church, staring at the cross, intruding on this woman's private space. Now he's got to kind of throw a knock at religion. That's that's a tech. You don't need to do that, bro. Let people feel how they want to feel, speak how they want to speak and think what they want to think. And they'll respect your boundaries. I, I'm, I'm not really rocking with Elgin in his statement right there. Elgin also decides now is probably a good time to leave. We then switch to Ethan and Jim returning home after speaking to Sarah. Tabitha and Julie greet them on the porch and Ethan tells his mom that he's not afraid anymore. Tabitha and Jim hug it out while Jim is surprised that Ethan is learning life lessons from the Cromenacle. Tabitha then notices the puzzle thing that Ethan assembled on the porch back in episode 3 before she saw the creepy little kids in her vision. Now, you guys have heard me talk about the Cromenacle and the Cave of the Lonely Dragon. I have this theory in the back of my head that Ethan's story is a direct parallel to the events that happen in this town. One of my theories is that Tabitha is in fact the Cromenacle. And the lonely dragon is the creepy kids that Tabitha first encountered in the caves below town with Victor when she dug that hole. In Ethan's story of the Cromenacle, we were told that the lonely dragon gave the Cromenacle a map to find her way home. I think this puzzle is the map and that Tabitha will play a huge role in figuring out how to return home. Anyway, we then switch to Mrs. Lou inside the diner doing dishes when she receives a visit from Sarah. 
Sarah simply states that she's sorry and she shouldn't have come here. Before she can leave, Mrs. Liu tells Sarah that she took him from her. She took care of Sarah, but she put hate inside her. And she knows why she came. Tianchen then goes in the back and grabs a box of Sarah's belongings to give to her. Sarah takes the box, but before she leaves, Mrs. Liu tells her to take it and never return. Now, real quick, am I the only one noticing how fluent Mrs. Liu is becoming in English? I'm so proud of her. Sarah takes like two steps outside when, oh shit, Kenny is walking up in his new fit that actually fits. No more dopey little fitting deputies outfit and he looks like something out of a gap ad but all jokes aside kenny has crazy black air force one energy because all he says is are you kidding me also another interesting observation is that kenny is still strapped and walks around with that thing on his hip like it's open carry out here kenny sees sarah walking out with a box and he takes that shit out of her hand and pours it all over on the street there are a few people in the background watching including elgin but nobody wants to smoke so they just sit back and watch whatever's about to happen happen sarah quickly picks something up off the ground and when kenny sees that there's something that means a lot to her he immediately grabs that shit out of her hand he asks her if it's important to her and mm, breaks that shit in front of everyone he then lets sarah know that he does not give up what boyd said and if she ever goes near his mom again that he's going to drag her psycho ass into the box himself kenny finally catches himself a bit and notices that everyone is watching and proceeds to go inside the diner seemingly to check on his mom sarah starts to pick up her stuff and elgin now tries to help her with at least picking up her stuff sarah grabs the rest of it and rushes off we then switch to marielle and christy with marielle helping christy with a haircut now this moment is cute with this new haircut really resembling the one that Christy had in the flashback of the last episode when she was showing Kenny's dad around the clinic. We then see Tilly walking in looking for Christy. They introduce themselves to each other when Tilly finally shows us what she's been hiding in her fanny pack. Tilly hands Christy her bottle of liquid morphine and implies that she's been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Christy understands the implication and promises to be there when she needs her. Tilly then mentions that there's been a lot of excitement in town now that Sarah is back. The news of Sarah's return instantly triggers Christy, who bursts out the door and says that she needs to go. Marielle chases her down, wondering why Christy is so excited. Christy explains that Sarah spoke to her before she tried to kill Ethan, and Christy feels partially responsible for that day because she somewhat enabled Sarah in her quest to kill Ethan if it meant that Sarah would get to see Marielle again. Marielle convinces Sarah to return back into the clinic. We then switch to Victor and Jade who are still in the car graveyard and Victor lets us know that the guy in the photo was named Christopher. Victor takes Jade to his car and tells him how Christopher used to be nice and would make people laugh until he changed. Victor gets apprehensive to continue talking and says that you don't understand. You shouldn't be asking these questions. And I'm wondering but like why is somebody listening? What do you mean? you shouldn't be asking these questions. That's a weird statement. Jade does his best to convince Victor to tell him more and Victor clams up. Jade apologizes for yelling and pleads with Victor to continue talking. Victor mentioned that everyone died. Christopher started seeing that symbol and everything changed. He changed and he stopped making everyone laugh anymore and he stopped smiling. One night, Victor's mom told Victor to hide somewhere different, somewhere Christopher didn't know about. And when he woke up the next morning, everyone, he just goes, there are bad things here and they make people do bad things. This seems like a reference to the flashback we saw in season one with young Victor coming out of hiding in that cellar outside of town. When Victor emerged from out of the cellar, he walked into town to see that everyone in town was dead. It was also in this scene that we see the boy in white seemingly waiting for Victor in the center of town along with an overly excited dog. Now, we've seen the boy in white and dogs a few times. We haven't yet learned their roles in whatever is happening. We then switch to Tabitha hanging out in the woods outside the cave where the monsters sleep while assembling the puzzle that Ethan was playing with. She's alone and this has me all sorts of nervous. She finishes assembling the puzzle and starts yelling out that she's here. 
After saying it for a while, out of nowhere, the garbage patch kids that Tabitha has been hallucinating start popping up out of the forest and start walking toward her. Tabitha tells the kids that she's not afraid of them and they just keep getting closer. As these kids get closer, Tabitha starts freaking all the way out and begging for the kids to not touch her. What's interesting is that the kids keep repeating the same phrase over and over. Ankui. Ankui? I'm, I'm sorry. Look, the episodes I see don't have subtitles, but we can absolutely talk about it next week after I see this one when it airs on TV with the subtitles. I want to know what they're saying. Jade comes out of nowhere and sees that Tabitha's freaking out, but the Garbage Patch Kids are all gone. Jade notices that Tabitha's nose is bleeding, but she's more concerned with finding out if Jade saw them too. He didn't. We then switch to Randall, who is renovating his new home a bit. Boyd is watching Randall working on his house when Jim walks up and they sort of make amends for Sarah. As Jim says, he didn't see a psychopath when he looked at Sarah today. Jim starts talking to Boyd about the radio and the voice he heard along with Donna and tells Boyd that he notices that he sees a lot of people push to their edge. And he asks Boyd if maybe that's the point. He tells Boyd that the voice knew what his wife was doing in the basement of their house and he thinks people are watching and listening to what they're doing. He also says another real thing when he says that in their world, there are experiments that have gone on like this since going back to World War II. Jim also says that they don't have to like each other, but they have to start working together on this. He challenges Boyd to give him a more rational explanation for what's happening. But rather than giving him an answer, he just tells Jim that he's got to go. Boyd then walks into the diner, and as soon as Boyd walks into the diner, the radio turns on and starts playing the 1963 song Candy Colored Clown by Roy Orbison. The lyrics for the song go, A candy colored clown they call the Sandman tiptoes to my room every night. Just to sprinkle stardust and to whisper, go to sleep, everything is all right. The writer of this song even has a unique explanation about the creation of this song, claiming that the origin for In Dreams came to him while he was sleeping, as many of his songs did. He often heard music while asleep with a radio jockey announcing that it was Elvis Presley's new song. For this song, however, he was half awake when he imagined it and thought, boy, that's good. This continues the trend of From using songs that supplement and support the events of the episode and even seems somewhat related to the title of the episode, Lullaby. Boyd calls out for Kenny's mom, but before we can find out if she hears him, we see the worms in his arms start moving under his skin, leaving us wondering what's going on and why. We then switch to Christy and Marielle in the clinic with Christy in one room getting dressed while Marielle is opening up the medicine cabinet and stealing some of the morphine that Tilly just brought to town and straight up drinking it. We then quickly switch to Jade throwing darts at a dartboard with the symbol on it. And we then switch to Ethan back on his porch assembling the puzzle that I thought we last saw with Tabitha in the woods. Well, Ethan has it now and he sees Sarah walking by it as he's putting it together and gives her the meanest look his little face can muster. We then see Randall seemingly finishing with his home renovations after installing a chair on the top of the bus and he begins whittling some wood. We then switch back to the diner with Mrs. Chen walking out the back to meet with Boyd who simply states, I was hoping we could talk when the episode ends. I like how this episode gives us a lot more to go with toward the mystery of this town. We finally get a new location with the car graveyard and we also learn about Victor's history in this town as well as about Christopher, the guy in the photo. Oh, and we saw the garbage pail kids jump Tabitha and leave her with a bloody nose. Man, this episode was pretty productive. Now, I promised those of you who stick around to this part of the video that I would have something special for you. And without further ado, here's Ricky. Thank you. I'm very, very excited about this. Um, I know you are very busy, so I'm going to be very brief. And I'm going to okay, start cool. off with my first question. Um, it's going to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> why, yeah. is, why is this show called From? I need someone to tell me, Yo, my audience, I... <laughs> everyone wants to know. Why is this show called From? <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, this is not dig it, John. <laughs> but from the jump, I was like, why is it called from? I'm like, you know, this is going to be impossible to Google, right? He's like, yep. 
And I'm like, all right. I personally hope that there's some reason, like maybe it adds to the mystery. Uh, I think something I saw on like Reddit, or I saw on some recently, they said, um, from yeah. is a preposition, like grammatically. And the people in town are prepositioned in the town. I don't fucking remember. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. I, I got a couple more. Um, okay. Now, your character, in my eyes, you know, you kind of started off as like Robin to Boyd's Batman in season two. Right. Yeah. 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 Talk about who is Kenny now in your head in season two versus who Kenny mm. was in season one. Mmm. That's powerful. I think, I think that, uh, yeah, he definitely was the Robin to, to, to Boyd's Batman. And I think that he's more of a Nightwing now. You know what I mean? He's more of a Nightwing now. And I think that, uh, you know, they're, they're going to have, they're going to have their moments. Um, will they heal? Like, will they kind of reconcile their relationship? It's really, really hard to, it's really hard to say, but, um, but at the same time, like, you know, he, he, he takes so much of what he thinks, the what the idea of being a man from Boyd, like he's, he's like a dad to him almost, you know? And so he takes so much of how to be a man, how to be a leader, how to be a, 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 a real person from, uh, from Boyd. And now he kind of has to shed that and figure out how to do that on his own, like stand up on his own two feet. So, so I think that's where he's at. Maybe he's Nightwing. Okay. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not going to ask you a theory because I, I read what happened when people have theories, but <laughs> do you know, like, have the showrunners, has John ever told you, like, he has an idea of how this, where the story is going, how it's going to end? Like, is there a preset ending in mind that anybody knows about or? So, the thing about John is, <laughs> he <laughs> has, uh, he's always from the, from the very beginning, I was like, like this is like my first like week at work too so like maybe this was the best move to like bring to the show and i'm like all right but i was like listen i'm gonna bounce my theories off all right and you <laughs> tell me and he's i said can you give me a yes or no he said i actually have a very good poker face i'm gonna give you nothing i'm like okay let's try it and you know that guy has a really good poker face because i was i was like is it this and he's just like mm. and i was just did nothing but <laughs> I am confident that he, 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 cause, cause the fact that he knows what not to tell me mm -hmm. indicates to me, he knows exactly where it's going. I, I think if I had to guess as, as a writer, he probably, he probably knows exactly where it's going in terms of the destination and kind of like the pit stops, but he's, you know, we're figuring out the route together as we go along because a lot of this stuff sometimes it's like, what I bring to the table as an actor, or say what Avery brings to the table as Sarah, it can it can change the dynamics of what happens in town and what happens in the story and what happens in the show. Um, but I think, yeah, he's you know he's like the he's the chess master. He's moving our pieces around because he knows how to get to that checkmate. I, you you kind of touched on my next question, which is like I was curious, how does the story or maybe the absence of knowing your character's fate? Like, how does right. that inform your performance? Does not knowing mm. what's going to happen next help come into character for you, like somebody in an uncertain situation? Yeah, for sure. Like, I think that, like, you know, like, I worked on shows before where it's like I, like, as a guest star, where I wouldn't watch the show because my character wouldn't know what happens in this world. He's being dropped in on this world. And I think that that's kind of what's happening here. It's like, I don't really know what's going on. Uh, and I don't really know the mystery, and that, that helps preserve that sense in, in Kenny. I think that helps all of us. Like Jeff Pinker said in the first table read that we ever had on Zoom, he said, listen guys, you should know just because of the nature of a show, due to the nature of a show like this, anyone at any given time could get killed off and it has nothing to do with performance or like anything personal like that. It's just for the sake of story. And so, yeah, every week we're all kind of like, I'm gonna die, somebody gonna die. Like, gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to also help the audience get to know you a little bit better. Like I'm following cool. you on social media, but I'm curious <laughs> if you can tell me um, what's something that you can geek out about for hours. Like what what's one of your main? Things? Um, besides your <laughs> romance with Cordy. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that. Oh, man, I can go on about that. No, uh, I, uh, I've been really into, I've been really into, like, uh, jiu-jitsu lately. Like, I've been doing no-gi for about a year and a half now. I've been trying to compete uh, as frequently as I can. That is, like, a whole, like, box of, like, learning right there. Um, but I also, like, really like, like, theory videos. That's why I kind of am very grateful that I'm working on the type of show that I'm working on because I'm the type of dude to, like, watch, like, every Easter egg video on, like, say, like, the MCU movies or, like, when Game mm-hmm. of Thrones was still on, like, every game. Like, I love the lore. Um, I'm not a huge Star Wars head, but I do watch, like, a lot of, like, the Star Wars canon, like, Star Wars, like, lore videos and stuff like that. That kind of stuff is just, it's just fun to me, like, world building and, like, being invested in the world like that. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to DM you some, some stuff about it to you later. But um, what's, what's, uh, what's the biggest uh, misconception people have of you? Sorry, Anthony, we have to wrap. We don't have oh, time. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate oh, your time. Um, thanks, man. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you. Thank you so much.